Hi, nice to meet you. I'm here sitting with Landon McKenzie, and we are preparing this asynchronistic talk that she will be delivering in just a second. My name is Marianne Landry, and I'm a graduate student from Emily Carr University of Art and Design. I also want to take a minute to acknowledge that we are doing this recording on unceded territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and um, Squamish Nation. Bonjour, mon nom est Marion Landry, enchantée de vous rencontrer. Je suis ici avec Landon McKenzie et on est en train de préparer une conversation qui va se dérouler uh, pour le moment sur Zoom et puis après dans le studio de Landon McKenzie. À toi, Landon. Thanks, Marion. And for everybody, um, I'm so lucky to have Marion assisting me on this project and a couple of other studio projects that I'm involved with this term. Um, as a professor emeritus, I'm sort of glad to still get a chance to work with students, and I'm really happy to be speaking to you today in this bottled version of myself. I know I'll be speaking to you more in person in a separate bottled version of myself uh, later. I just wanted to take a moment to um, say that it's a privilege to speak to you and that I've been making art for probably about 50 years when I look back at starting art school in 1972 in Halifax, which I sort of go into in this recording that uh, Marion helped me make in my studio where Zoom doesn't really work. I want you to remember when you're looking at pictures and paintings that some of them are in different timelines and on uh, different kinds of surfaces of paper or canvas. Um, we saw in a couple of etchings, uh, some installation shots, some big linens, some linens on floors, some linen finished. It's up to you to kind of not worry too much about the date and about the specificity. It's, it's more important that you just come to terms and recognize that these aren't the paintings you're seeing. These are logos to the paintings. They are uh, things that were photographed and then they were digitized and then you're seeing them on a screen. You're maybe seeing them on your phone, on a small computer screen or an iPad. And so you're really getting this this object that I have spent sometimes months on, <laughs> sometimes minutes on, sometimes months on, uh, yet sometimes years on, uh, in, a, in a very, very uh, distilled version. So that's really important. I, I think I, I enjoy so much seeing real art and understanding that when you see a real painting, whether you like it or don't like it, you, you, you first experience the work. You know, your body goes, oh, there, I like this, or, I don't like this, uh, what is this, uh, what's this made of? Uh, who made this? How, how did they make this? Uh, and then you you sort of rummage in the work. So you're you're sort of peeling back layers of the painting as the painter may have put them down. You're trying to figure out by going left and right and up and down and in and out and back and forward if it's a large work. And many of my pieces you'll see are quite large, sort of the size of garage doors or in my case sort of mimicking the sort of history of sort of 16 millimeter film. As a kind of immersive space, sometimes illusionistic, sometimes romantic, sometimes corny or silly or totally invented. I don't use any photographs to make any of the work. Everything is just sort of follow a little thread of logic, put something down and follow another little thread of logic, put something else down, react to that. And I think through the talk that I did in the studio, you will come to understand a little bit more about um, my, my process and what what matters to me. And I really, um, I'm glad that we're able to do this in this crazy February 2022 moment. So again, see you soon. First, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm talking to you from Vancouver. I'm in the studio here and I'm very grateful to be on this territory at the Coast Salish, the Musqueam, the Squamish and the Slavitooth. It's a warehouse space where I've lived and worked, not lived, but feel like I lived for 30 years, 35, almost 35 years. And actually we taught Emily Carr uh, fourth year students in this space. I wanted to talk today a little bit about what it's like to have this studio and this has been my studio base for 35 years now in Vancouver, ever since I came to this city from Montreal and Toronto in order to take up a position at Emily Carr University where I taught for all, all of about three and a half decades. This is a building that we took over about 35 years ago, a group of artists. So it's one of the longest standing independent studio buildings in Vancouver. And 
most of us have worked here longer than we've ever lived in any home. Mm. And I have quite a big chunk of space here that have different sort of brain sites, I would say. So I make certain projects in one room and other projects in another room. I'm working on a very big project that I can't show anybody that will eventually end up as a public commission. It's taught me a lot about discipline and working through an idea that goes over a long period of time. The room that I'm showing you here in the slides is uh, the room where I've done a, a large show of work that will be shown, many of these will be shown at the Nicholas Metivier Gallery in May in Toronto. And they continue my interest as an artist in making pictures of things that the world can't photograph, that there is no sort of stable picture of. And I think thinking about COVID and the times that we're living in, I would reflect that long before COVID, a lot of my paintings had these kind of floating signal-like interests. Uh, you can see in some of these pictures we're showing you that uh, I was using a theme called particles in the idea that in between me and the person I'm speaking with, there are gazillions of particles that just hold the shape. Some shapes turn into chairs or easels or paintings um, and other particles are just the air that we breathe. And under COVID, at the beginning when we didn't really understand the the phenomena of it, everything seemed contagious. There was this feeling of living inside of a very dangerous air space, touch space. You know, if you touched anything, if you touched your face, and you couldn't make a picture of this thing. But yet the Globe and Mail would make a picture, the New York Times would make a picture, and various scientists would make pictures. And in a way, they all looked like a lot of my paintings that were these little circular things that had little colored doodads. So in this painting here, you can see I, I'm continuing a thematic of Time Machine. So in Time Machine 1, I had worked on it for many years and it ended up being shown in Toronto in the last exhibition that I had. And over time, I morphed that into Time Machine 2 and Time Machine 3. You can see here that I've been packing up Time Machine uh, 3 and uh, the way that I get them out of the studio is I have to put them on big sono tubes in order that they just get out the door. Sometimes this comes up with students, you know, this ambition in the work. And I think if I got one piece of great advice early on in my career, it was to put the ambition in your work and the rest would follow. We all know that's not true, that there's people that put a lot of ambition in their work and a lot of care and attention and things don't follow for them. So what are those conditions that help? I, I think I'm lucky because I went to NESCAD or the, what was called the Halifax School in the early 70s when it was a conceptual sort of hotbed and whether or not I knew it at the time, there were little signals in, in the air and in the way in which we could think about art that have sustained me to this day. One of, it, one of the ones that I, I value perhaps the most is this idea of a daily ritual intervention or something that you do that moves things forward bit by bit, so as a conceptual framework. So I didn't study painting, but I studied printmaking partly because I just needed someone to value that I showed up. And I would say that's another principle I've taken to this day, which would be if you don't set up the conditions for how I will show up, I won't get very far. Um, and I've been very lucky recently to have um, wonderful assistants, that, uh, some of whom have come through the graduate program at Emily Carr, where there's this kind of sense of accountability. And I'm accountable to more than just myself. I have to get my act together. I have to know what we're doing. I have to provide, you know, lunch or paint or a plan. And as I get older, I find that it's been very helpful to just articulate again that if you don't create a pattern in your life for which your art will succeed, it's, it's going to be an uphill battle. I went to graduate school in Montreal. That would be the next best move I probably made by accident. I went there because there was one woman teaching in that program called Irene Widom. And in Halifax, I had never had a female teacher and not that that should matter perhaps. And I didn't really know the difference. But after I'd begun to work there and I was also just making prints in a, in kind of a vacuum. I had my own room. I was changing my plate every day, kind of going into some sort of future unknown place as if the plate itself, which was 17 inches square could hold the future. And, we sat down for a critique and 
Irene basically, who she was a very well-known artist at that time too, just said, you know, well, what what is it that this is? What is this? And didn't fight me. Um, clearly could see what I was doing. Was clearly interested in what I was doing. And I was kind of flabbergasted because I had gotten very far in my little world so far, kind of by pushing against some of these very strong male characters who were artists, well-known artists. Um, I, I guess today in quotation marks, we might call them <laughs> They were really sort of vulgar sometimes and boisterous and they were womanizers and they drank a lot and they were very well thought of. Not all of them, of course, I'm sort of generalizing, but I was very good at dealing with these people. I had, I had been brought up around quite a few of them who were intellectuals or art makers. I knew that they were important people. I knew that what they did va was valued and mattered. It was also tucked in my back pocket. So when Irene asked me what I was doing and I sort of fell apart, just because I wasn't meeting resistance. I, it was in a way she was the first person to really hand the baton over to say, you know, this is your life and this is your art and you're go girl, go. I'm not standing in your way. I'm just gonna ask you some key questions. It was a really important moment that I can look back at. I always, I think it's important to sort of set the time. So in the early seventies, when I, I kind of quit high school in downtown Toronto to go to Halifax. So remember, here's some conditions. Uh, a beer is a quarter. Our tuition is a hundred bucks. We're not allowed to wear pants to school. That's high school. Of course, at Nescad, you don't have to wear clothes even. It's a complete free world. I end up living in a big hippie commune or communal house or cooperative house. And that was the only way you could live with your boyfriend because if you didn't wear a wedding ring, you would not be rented an apartment. Abortion was illegal and totally black market. Unless, of course, you were upper middle class and white and your good family doctor would arrange some other little quiet procedure. So I think it's really important that we also understand that the word conceptual art is sort of being flung around, but it's not yet seen as a movement in art history. We aren't discussing something called postmodernism it will be in the 1980s that the 1970s will be categorized with what happened in these shifts, starting in the 60s with minimalism, sometimes seen now as more of an anti-war protest than a just rarefied relationship to form over content, which of course is how it had been presented to me. And then how the conceptualists come in and kind of fill that space with, if all idea is important and it doesn't matter who exactly makes it, that didn't really work for a lot of us because we actually want to make things. And to be truly true to the conceptual movement, you couldn't, it wasn't really up to you to make the thing. So that sort of backfired for people like me who were learning to sort of think through their hands. Like, what is this and what's going on here? And what is this blue versus this pink? And then if, if color or line or that space starts to make sense to you and you awaken to it as a rationale, you can learn as a woman working in that field to camouflage. So I would say early on, I learned a very good double language. So on the one hand, I knew what was going on in my work for myself, some sort of thread that was kind of unclear, something that I was trying to figure out for myself. And on the public side, it read very clearly within other kinds of rules of engagement. So my name being Landon was very helpful because it read as male. When I had left graduate school and I'm a young painter in Montreal and the new image painting scene is kind of hot and moving on and I'm part of this, I make what's seen as large competent work that also reads as male. And though one can dispute this, I had too many people tell me once they discovered that I was a female after dear Mr. McKenzie you know, the AGO would like to buy your work, what's it made of? When corrected that I was a woman, they would say, oh, but you make such good work for a, and then sort of fall into the next hole. And this isn't once, this is dozens of times. This kind of condition doesn't exist for you today. However, the art world is stratified. I always like to think of it as being on these little train tracks. And I, I like to play in a kind of big pond, a kind of ambitious place, and therefore, taking up the opportunity to be a professor, which not everybody can do, but 
I was offered first teaching as a grad student, then offered more teaching because somebody went on maternity leave and didn't come back, and then offered more because I won the Quebec Biennale of painting, and they suddenly needed a young hotshot painter or came out to Emily Carr, where the statistics told me that I was the first woman in 33 years hired on an incoming tenure track position, not someone who was already at the school who then was made permanent. And when I arrived in Vancouver, the big energy was in photography. And this was fantastic for me because it became a real discussion about what was painting's job. So if the big job of photography, as changed by Jeff Wall and others, was that it was also dealing with fiction through the introduction of multiple takes or setting up actors or setting up sets, and later digital, that painting's job could be redefined once again so that I needed to make pictures of phenomena or of things that, again, I couldn't reach for in another place. I also really like to think about paintings as a text. Different theorists have offered me some of these tools. So, for instance, the scale of my work is a text, and the linen is a text, and the images, of course, are a text. The palette I use is a text. As someone who never studied painting, I didn't have a list in my head of what not to do. But I had a grandmother who had studied art. She had been studied, she had studied in New York in the, before 1920. She was an incredible influence in the sense that, how hard can it be? She made paintings. She made scrambled eggs. She raised children. I always had that kind of, this can't be too mysterious. I like purple. Let's make purple paint. How will we do this? Figure it out. Um, so my grandmother would have said, just take a closer look. You don't need to like it, but it deserves your attention. And when I began teaching, I also had to reject most of the teaching models that I had grown up with. And I had to just sort of follow the things that sort of mattered. And one of the things that I really liked when I taught a lot was just separating the intuitive, messy, murky, making things part from sort of very analytical critiques where we could step back put up the work and sort of go at it. Like, what's going on here? Just read it, read it back to ourselves. What's it made of? What's, what's going on in all of it? And I think I brought that culture to Emily Carr a little bit. I think I was one of the people that began part of what I would say defined our, our, our department there and our, and our effort there, which has changed, of course, over time. But there was a moment when so many of the smartest students would just study painting because it was a place where these very rigorous debates and looking sessions happened, even if they might be studying sculpture or photography or going off to make those things. And the other thing that has always interested me is that there's so many long periods between these hot moments when you're winning you know, a big prize or your work is bought by a major museum or you've had an amazing article written about you. There's a lot of downtime where you still have to get to the studio every day you still have to figure out like why it's important. And of course, within that, you need a family structure or a life structure that is supportive of that. You can't fight it all the time. It's good to fight. I think art is a kind of resistance. And I think if we just say, oh yes, that's lovely, that's lovely, and this is lovely, and this is all lovely, it doesn't really help us. But at the same time, I would acknowledge that I've had a very supportive family in my, fam my parents first, who fought me all the way to art school. Therefore, that was very helpful. Then they were very supportive. My long-term partner, Donald, our three kids who didn't think much about the fact that mummy was at the studios and never came home Friday nights. It was my one night that I couldn't blame it on anyone else. I just had to be at the studio and skip the birthday parties or the openings and just see what, what I'm up against and, and stay as long as I want and just drop any kind of tape loop that was because I had the kids, because I had the students, because I had the job, because I had the meetings, that none of that could really get in, in the way. So the other trick was spreading my ideas over very big, ambitious sort of projects. So I made this rule that I couldn't finish a work within a year. I could have five on the go at once. I could visit them like you water your plants. I could engage with them and add these different layers of engagement, get them up on stretchers finally, and really think about how you take it to a new place. 
There's another line in my head that I got from my, one of the graduate people in my life when I, when I did a master's degree that was really helpful, Guido Molinari. He was one of the sort of legends of Montreal formalist stripe painting. He said that anyone could start a great painting and very few people could finish a great painting. That was, that's a really important little piece of information that I tucked away and I carry with me in every pocket that really it's, it's be reckless at the start of your work, put it all down, it's just paint, it's just canvas, it's just linen, it's it, this, it is a little bit of it's time, it's money, it's space, it's thought, but it's how you pull it together in the end that really distinguishes whether, whether or not that's ready to go on and have a public life. And for many people, putting their art out to a public life is probably very dangerous and destructive. For me, when they're ready to go on and have a public life, it's fantastic and I've been super lucky. I, I look forward to this exhibition in May that I'm having. I'm very lucky to have a gallery that respects the way that I work, gives me the time and space and to just do my thing. They've never told me to paint smaller or different. <laughs> I don't think that's true of everybody's experience. I know that I'm, I'm lucky. I'm also lucky to be, to have many works in all of the Canadian museums. And in some cases like the Vancouver Art Gallery, I have around nine works or the National Gallery around nine works. So being collected in depth where you, you, you've been given a chance to be part of art history in our country. That's an incredible privilege. So I go to the studio knowing that I still have, you know, a couple of decades ahead of me, but that uh, things have to stay authentic and I can take my time to make sure that they're good. Whatever that means for me, they're good. Meanwhile, I just, I love that I've been able to have a life as an artist where the intellectual side of me and the idea side of me is, is totally engaged with making art. And then the physical, energetic sort of part of me. And then finally, I suppose, what's left, um, be, be just being able to pull it off with maybe just, just a lot of luck at right time, right place, just staying tuned up enough with the times that the paintings still have some relevance. So thanks for listening and go forward and make some interesting stuff.